Democracy. Good evening, everyone. And welcome to tonight's national conversation on civility. I want to welcome those who are watching us on live stream as well. Tonight's national conversation on civility grew out of a partnership this year between the American Psychological Association and the National Institute for Civil Discourse. I should say I'm Arthur Evans. I am the CEO of the American Psychological Association. Uh, in a moment, you will uh, meet the leader from NICD. Both of our organizations are interested in helping to bridge this gap to improve the tenor of discourse in our nation and by extension to improve the lives, the quality of lives of individuals. APA conducts a, an annual stress survey uh, and last year we found that almost 60% of Americans feel that the current social divisiveness is causing them stress. 60%, uh, which is no doubt uh, contributing to the high levels of negativity in our social discourse. Living with this type of stress is not good for our emotional nor our physical health. Psychological research has a lot to say about this and we hope that we will have an opportunity to talk about that. And now it's my privilege to introduce Dr. Carolyn Lukensmeyer. Um, and she is the director of the National Institute for Civil Discourse, which is co-sponsoring this event for us tonight. Thank you very much, Dr. Evans. All of us at the National Institute for Civil Discourse are absolutely delighted to be in partnership with, NI with the American Psychological Association, understanding that since the presidential election of 2016, incivility has really come across the country in our families, in our neighborhoods, in our places of worship, in our places of work. So it is really disturbing the quality of life of millions of Americans. And that's what we're here tonight to talk about. And we hope to engage all of you in being part of the solution to what can be done about this. I also want to welcome all the people who are watching this and live streaming. We know there are people from more than 30 states and thousands of people around the country. We do hope that any of you who are using social media, either here in the audience or in the live streaming across the country, will in fact do your comments on Twitter at hashtag revivecivility. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you the moderator for this evening. At NICD, we're very proud that Scott Simon is on our National Advisory Board. And I'm sure most of you in the audience are quite familiar with Scott. He's been a reporter <clears throat> and a broadcaster for many decades. He's been in all 50 states, in most countries. I want to really quote the Washington Post as they talk about the not NPR's weekend edition with Scott Simon, because I think it captures Scott perfectly. It is the most literate, witty, moving, and just plain interesting news show on any dial. With Scott moderating tonight, this is bound to be a very interesting evening. Please welcome Scott. I think I'm supposed to be here. Well, nice to see everybody. I was wondering who was going to turn out for a conversation on civility uh, on a rainy night following an extraordinary presidential press conference. I don't know how many of you were able to see it, but I, I suspect some of the things we're going to be talking about tonight might have um, one way or another found resonance in that press conference. Let me put it that way. Uh, it, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, right now Dr. Jonathan Haidt, who is a social psychologist at New York University. If Dr. Haight could join us right now. And uh, Sally Cohn, you probably uh, recognize her from uh, appearances on CNN. I'm going to her, uh, by the way, you both have books that are thoughtfully available for sale following the, following the, it's an amazing coincidence, isn't it? That they, oh, D Sally Cohn. We're all having a hard time figuring it out. I was, uh, 
I was about to mention some other bona fides. Oh my God, you were. I'm so sorry. Yeah, well, no, we're we're all kind yeah, of no, 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 standing in the wings with Geraldine's calling us. You know, civil anticipation. Us. And Dr. Evans will be joining us too. Yeah. Well, uh, then the uh, I, I think all the hosannas of praise will just save them for a while. It's okay. fine. Just slip them in casually. Um, <laughs> look, um, I, I, something that Carolyn didn't mention. I've sometimes been assailed on Twitter. Uh, as a tireless, I think they mean tiresome, uh, apologist for civility. Uh, uh. And, and I have to tell you, it's getting a little harder sometimes. Um, I, I don't, honestly, and I've said this on the air, I don't, I don't, I don't put responsibility for what I consider to be a lack of civility. Um, I don't put it equally on both sides of the political ledger. Let me put it that way. I think uh, certainly the people who are in power, this administration, uh, this past year and a half have added uh, a note of incivility, more than a note, note after note, uh, practically an orchestra sometimes, um, of incivility and just outright meanness that has been particularly meanness directed towards, towards all Americans, but I think specifically directed towards immigrants towards members of minority groups, uh, towards women, and towards the press. And I just find that kind of rhetoric to be un-American. Mm. And I don't have a stronger epithet than that. Um, all of that being noted, I, I think we can probably all think of examples of incivility uh, from people with uh, conspicuously different points of view at the same time, but maybe the general level uh, of conversation, and particularly, I think, political give and take in this country um, ha has been rubbed dangerously raw sometimes, if I might put it uh, that way. Um, and of course, at the very heart of democracy is, is the whole idea that we need to talk to each other, is the whole idea that we need to hear each other respectfully. Um, and it's the whole idea that, that if we're going to reach anything resembling common solutions, there has to be a common conversation. <clears throat> I don't sound, want to sound like a Pollyanna on this. I, 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 I understand that there are times when people are uh, exasperated and think that, that no, other, uh, no other quality of public dialogue works. Let's put it that way. Um, and for example, when we come to the public use of profanities, you know, um, they're there for a reason, and sometimes they're the only word you can use. Let's put it that way. But uh, all of that being said, I think various kinds of profanities have been uttered over the past year and a half that have really dragged down the level of conversation in this country and made it difficult for us to, uh, to exchange ideas and made it difficult for us to reach out towards each other um, with a level of civility that enables a conversation to go on, that helps us reach common solutions, um, and that helps us, for that matter, express what our deepest feelings are, because people aren't going to hear them if there are these red flags of incivility that keep flying in our face. So uh, let me begin by asking everybody here, and I'm going to begin, if, if I could, with you, um, Sally. It, are we wrong? to notice this change over the past year and a half? Has it been building? <clears throat> um, so there's a lot of ways I can answer that. Uh, yeah. But I think I want to start by picking up on something you said, which uh, I half agree with and I half don't. Mm -hmm. Because in, I hope, our aspirational sense of what this country is, can be, should be, uh, I think you're entirely right that it's un-American. It's un-American to uh, demean and dehumanize other people, especially groups of people, because of who they are or what they believe. That goes against the core values that we supposedly have espoused from our beginning. And at the same time, it has always also been true that we've never lived up to those values. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, that we are a country that was Found it, that said we were about freedom and equality and liberty for all that was founded on ostensibly a genocide which was premised on racial and ethnic superiority that then was built uh, through 
slavery and, and, and legalized and enshrined slavery, and at every step along the way has uh, fought tooth and nail against giving basic rights, equality, and dignity to group after group after group. Not to mention the fact that at least two points in American history we had, you know, we can say how bad it is, I mean, we can watch the press conference today, we can watch uh, everything that's going on with Kavanaugh, we can say how bad it is now, and it is bad, and it does feel like it's getting worse. And at the same time, at two points in US history, we had members of Congress literally beat other members of Congress to a bloody pulp on the floor of Congress. Mm -hmm. So I, for I, me, I, I don't doubt right. that that would happen today. It could, <laughs> um, but it but, hasn't but, yet. Let me point, it was, yeah. it was 150 years ago, right? Correct, my point yeah. only being, right, that I, and similarly, I, like you, do not think both sides are equal in their culpability. I, however, take the position that I don't think uh, it matters who did it first, and it matters who did it worse, or if it's worse today, or right? It's bad enough, and it's toxic, and the difference is, and I do think this is why it feels worse. Mm -hmm. Is that once upon a time, maybe, you know, uh, you know, I'm not gonna, you were once upon a time still in the media, but those of us who maybe, you know, 20 years ago were not, we could have sat around and, all right, maybe it was uncivil, a little on television, or on, but we would sit around and if we said something nasty about some Republican or some Democrat or some celebrity, it stayed between us. And now we all are surrounded by incivility in, sort of 360, 24 seven ways because of cable news, because of social media, and we participate in it in extraordinarily amplified and amplifying ways. And that feels different. But again, to my point, like, you know, we could argue forever who did it worse, who did it first, I just think enough. And it is essential, I believe, to our health as a multiracial, uh, pluralistic society that we figure out how to coexist with our differences and disagreements, which by the way I think are important and should be celebrated, are part of what make us great as people and as a country, and at the same time be able to be respectful, civil, decent, seek understanding uh, right alongside that. Let me ask our two professionals, um, psychiatric professionals on the panel. Um, are there reasons for this, doctors? Reasons for? In, increase in incivility? Well, I don't know about reasons for the increase, um, but clearly, you know, we're at a point in our history where um, it's more acceptable to be in, um, um, uncivil. And uh, it does get in the way of us progressing as a country. It gets in the way of us being uh, productive, taking on uh, important social complex issues. And I think it's important for us to figure out a way to get through that. Um, I think that uh, incivility comes about for multiple reasons. Uh, some of them have to do with, um, frankly, um, our inability to talk in a way when we are disagreeing with a person. For example, um, uh, a person who doesn't have the language um, uh, and um, the ability to disagree with another person who um, you know who they disagree with uh, is is a, is a problem, and um, we don't spend enough time helping children, uh, others to have that language in order to uh, disagree in a way that's um, respectful. So I think that's part of it. I think that um, uh, you know the point that you were making, Sally, about um, you know you can live in a world now where you only hear people who agree with you, uh, and I think that makes it very difficult for people who don't have the experience in disagreeing and being around people who have different viewpoints. So I think there are multiple reasons why we're in this uh, position, uh, but I do think that there are ways that we can uh, work through it. I think there are things that. Uh, organizations like APA is doing to work through that, and I hope we get a chance to talk about some of that. Mm -hmm. Dr. Hey, let me turn to you with the same question, but I, Dr. Evans mentioned um, we can live in echo chambers now. We can choose to not be unruffled by any idea that upsets us, and and we can choose, in fact, to be fluffed up uh, and encouraged in whatever ideas we want. I mean, people who, who deeply believe that man never landed on the moon 
can go on YouTube, can go on the internet, they can find yeah. what they will consider to be evidence and arguments to mm -hmm. uh, support that cockamamie notion. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and you can, you can take any, any argument from there. Yes, so the, that echo chamber effect is one that I think we've all been hearing a lot about for the last two years, and then S Sally went through some of the reasons that social media is doing this to us. I'd like to answer in a, in a broader way and say, the original question is, you know, is this really happening, is this real? Um, I've been studying this for a number of years. I started looking at political polarization around 2007 or eight, uh, and there are at least 10 reasons why things are getting worse. I'm not gonna list them all, don't worry, but just a couple. I, I'm just couple. going to gently suggest yeah. give us maybe the top three, but that's sure. the, uh, um, no wait, so, wait, wait, that's not, we'd love to hear. <laughs> all 10 of your All reasons. 10. Yeah. Um, so the first thing to realize is that the 1940s through 1970s was an historically unusual period in American history uh, of political amity. The ability to, uh, our, civil, our, our political discourse was much more civil than it had been even before. Everything was pulling in the same direction. Mm -hmm. Most importantly, nothing brings people together like fighting a war against perfect evil. And so the generation, that what we call the greatest generation, they all pulled together. They all, the, all of our politicians for decades had served in the, in the military. So that political class was able to do battle during the day, but then have a drink together at night. The way the world looks to you between about uh, 14 and 24 sticks with you for life. There's some new research on that. Um, so the greatest, everybody who remembers the war had that going for them. Um, whereas in the 60s, the baby boomers, their, their basic political formation was fighting each other with horrible accusations at each other. So when the baby boomers take over in the 90s, things begin getting much worse. Now the greatest generation is still around, but now they're gone. And as they left Washington, that steadying hand, that basic decency, the idea that you generally wouldn't curse, you wouldn't say the F word if you're the president, well, that's changed around a lot. I shouldn't, but anyway, my point is, <laughs> norms of decorum have, have dropped. The media landscape was unusually fo unusually focused with three networks. But you know, in the early days of the Republic, it was horribly uh, um, uncivil. Um, the loss of a common enemy when the Soviet Union fell. Um, rising education turns out to make us more uncivil because more educated people care more about symbolic politics. Um, they're more involved. So for a whole variety of reasons, Americans hate each other across the aisle much more than they did. You've all heard the stat that in the 1960s, People generally were, on average, they, were, they didn't want their children to marry some of a different race or religion, but different party didn't matter, and now it's exactly the opposite. So, so a lot has right, changed. Right? Yeah. Yeah. A lot has changed, things are a lot worse, and almost none of these trends can be reversed. Hmm. Carolyn, you've been living with this and trying to do something about it for a few years now. Well, I think one thing is important to add to what's already been said is something that is completely unique since the 2016 election. You know, we had an election in 2000, the outcome of which was exactly the same as this one in terms of one candidate won the popular vote and the other candidate won the electoral college. But if you go back to 2000, when that election was over, of course, there were probably maybe even millions of Democrats that never gave George W. Bush a chance. But they never attacked the people who voted for George W. Bush. It really stayed at the leader level. What's really different, what's really different this time around, post the presidential election, is that ordinary Americans in their lives, whether it's at work or places of faith, in their neighborhoods, even in families, there is a real holding on to an emotional judgment, moralistic in many cases, about if you voted for Hillary and I voted for Trump or vice versa, there is really something wrong with you, and I really am gonna hold that against you. At the Institute, already during the Republican primary, and then it still continues today, we get thousands of messages, email, social media, even phone calls, ranging in every level of human behavior. A New England mother around Thanksgiving, I, I still feel the emotion in her voice, who called and said, we have two daughters. They're both in Ivy League schools in New England. They haven't spoken to each other since the election. They're coming home. What do we do to have a, a, a Thanksgiving? And frankly, we respond to that by creating a whole initiative called Setting the Table for Civility. And tens of thousands of people used it. We heard from 
Protestant ministers, Jewish rabbis. I've been with this congregation for 30 years, but we're no longer a community. People are still at odds with each other. <clears throat> Biggest surprise to me, we actually got calls as recently as two months ago from major US corporations saying we have some product innovation teams that have not come back to the same level of productivity post the presidential election of 2016. You all know what that means. Product innovation teams are the bottom line for those corporations mm -hmm. five, 10 years from now. So this is like a virus in our society. And, and, and we, the implication of that is because they disagree about politics? But they lost trust and made a judgment about who voted for whom and haven't rebuilt so that literally the request of us is do you have tools that we could introduce, which we are doing actually, that would allow people to get past that decision, come to some level of understanding, why did your life experience lead you to vote for whom you voted for and why did my life experience lead me to make the judgment I made? And somehow to take that and respect it and move on. Mm -hmm. Let, let me invoke something um, <clears throat> that, that happened just in the past few days. Uh, and it's interesting because a few weeks ago something similar happened and uh, I found my tiresome reputation for civility damaged in that I could understand why it happened. Uh, Ted Cruz and his wife were apparently reading, uh, eating at a restaurant here in Washington, D.C. I'm not sure which one. And a group of people surrounded them and booed. And his opponent in that, in that fierce Texas ten, uh, Senate race, Beto O'Rourke, uh, on Twitter said this should not have happened. Um, Senator Cruz and Heidi Cruz are entitled to their privacy. And, and I, I cheered for that. But a few weeks ago, when um, Secretary of Homeland Security, I guess, uh, Kristen Nielsen, was in a Mexican restaurant, um, and when Sarah Huckabee Sanders was in a restaurant in Virginia, um, something similar happened. And I found myself thinking, you know, we're lucky in the media. I, Sarah, I hope Sarah Huckabee Sanders does come in for an interview. Um, or Secretary Nielsen, we're able to ask tough questions. But I can see where people who were identified with policies that many of the people who work in restaurants are thinking, this is the one chance I'm going to have. If I might quote Hamilton, I am not going to throw away my shot. <laughs> this is the one chance I'm going to have to somebody with power in this administration to say, I think your policy is deeply reprehensible. And I found myself thinking, you know, I'm okay with that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's some policies that are worth ruining the night out for, if that's, if that's what it is. Mm -hmm. And I found myself unexpectedly sympathetic to the people who made that kind of representation. Now, I don't think I'd do it. I don't think I'd do it because I, I, I get away, as I said, to ask them tough questions in another forum. But I don't know that I wouldn't do it. I, I can't speak for what my feelings would be on the spot. So is this an indication of we're all deteriorating in our values? <laughs> or, or is it an indication that our values are being tested yes. by, by very strange and, and ugly circumstances? Dr. Evans yeah. and, and then Sally. Sure. Uh, well, you know, I, when that happened, uh, when the first incident happened with uh, Sarah Buck Huckabee, I, um, I asked myself, if that were a politician that I endorsed, would I want that to happen? Mm -hmm. And I think the, the core of civility is treating people the way we want to be treated. Um, and so if I'm honest, I would have to say, even if I agree with the politics of the people, I can't agree with that way of coming at it. Um, and I think the, the whole thing with civility is that we, we have to break the, the cycle. Um, if, um, it, one of the things we know from research is that uh, if someone is uncivil to me, I'm much more likely to be uncivil to the next person. It is contagious. Um, and so if we're really committed to the idea of uh, creating a more civil society, we have to be willing to interrupt that kind of thing. So I, I would say that 
you know, you know, in that case, that's not the right way to, to go about it. It's not the way I would want to be treated. I was a policymaker for 20 years. I'd feel pretty bad if someone came up to me in a restaurant and said, I don't like your policy, and got in my face about it. Um, and so I, I think we have to really check that, uh, question that, um, uh, approach it a different way. Hmm. Sally, I'm going to guess some people come up to you sometimes. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, here's the thing. I, I'll, I'll make a couple quick points here. One is, so, um, first of all, I actually was one of those people, not in 2000. I write about this in my book. But in 2004, I definitely thought people who voted for George W. Bush were stupid. And I said as much, but I didn't say it on social media. It didn't exist. I said it on email. But I talked about, you know, I don't know if, show of hands, anyone else circulated the map of dumb fuckistan, pardon my French, but it showed the parts of the country we could just cleave off and make a different country because they were aforementioned blanket, you know. Can, may, may I say something about the words you said? <laughs> I just want to note, my wife is French, and she likes to point out to people, fuck is actually not, it's French for seal, and that's... <laughs> Probably not what you meant, but go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, I, 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 that's, but you, I'm you, sure <laughs> going to use that with the FCC because we all know I'm about this close to cursing on air. Four, four. All right. Yeah. So that's point one, and yeah. and I, I do think that that's just that's just the reality of it. Also, my background was as a community organizer, so I spent the first 16 years of <coughs> my career as an organizer and activist. And in fairness, I organized protests on people's front lawns. Mm -hmm. So, and I, it's now a tactic that I question, and in the wake of these several incidents, it, it, it mm -hmm. rankled me. But I also, look, I'm, first of all, and I'm, partly I'm just contrarian, so I'm going to end up the contrarian on the panel, but also I'm very careful to not be preachy about civility, right? I happen to think it is a moral and practical path, but it is, it, if we're preaching it, then it sort of defeats both of those purposes. I'll come back to that in a second. What I will also say is, and this isn't, but the 1940s and the 1960s may have been, in fact, a very civil time. And we can point to you know, the, the relationships that Republicans and Democrats, for instance, had in Congress, whatever. It was also the era of Jim Crow laws. We had legal segregation in this country. So I don't care how which, civil which you are. Which Republicans and Democrats I don't, agree Right, on. exactly. Yeah. So on some level, I don't care how civil you are if you're doing some really uncivil stuff. And what I recognize about the moment we're in in this country, which is true, is that I, I recognize the moral imperative that people feel where two years ago, four years ago, 10 years ago, they might not have gone up to the press secretary in a restaurant with their family. But now they feel like we sure as hell have to because <clears throat> this guy wasn't even elected by the popular vote. Protest isn't working. Congress is only, what else are we going to do? They're separating children from families. Like these are life or death moments. Now, I can tie myself in knots about, well, why now and not then and whatever, but I understand the imperative around that. For me, personally, and it's a personal thing, it comes back to, as I said, morality and, pra and practicality, which is practically speaking, look, I think that I don't want people who voted for Trump in 2016 to vote for him again. Just going to be super obvious about that. I am a partisan. And I've never met anyone who changed their mind or heart on an issue or on a candidate or on a side in general because they were hated into it. I just never saw it work. So that's the spirit in which I think about the pragmatic side of civility. And then morally, right, I'm a progressive because I supposedly believe in progress and the ability of people to change and grow. And I also am a progressive because I say I believe in the equal dignity and humanity of all people. And so the question really is, do I mean all people? All people. Because usually I just mean people on my side or the people I care about. But if I really mean all people, then that includes believing in the equality and, and dignity and humanity, even of people who don't believe in my dignity and humanity, which is really where it becomes almost spiritual, philosophical, right? Mm -hmm. And again, not preachy. What? You look back at the history of movements, you needed both, you need, you need lots of sides. So trust me, I got brothers and sisters out there who are very in your face, who are very, you know, um, seal civility. Not, I can say seal now. It, it's not of, as effective when you, yeah, I know. I, 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 you'd right? think the French would come up with something a little yeah. more explosive than that too, but I... Uh, um, yeah. 
but you know, that, that it also, I, I, I recognize the tensions. And I recognize the sense of desperation people feel in this moment. And the um, existential threat that people feel in this moment. Did, did, did I hear you say that you, you regret some of the tactics that you helped engineer? I do. I look now at, you know, these are case by case situations, right? I mean, you, you, but I look now at people, uh, you know, look, having a kid and imagining people organizing a protest on my lawn. If I had a lawn, I live in New York, so it's hard to imagine having a lawn, but let's just hypothesize. You know, and if my kid were home alone and right, and the scenario, I think about it a little differently. Would I want a protest organized while I was eating at a restaurant? No. Then again, do I understand the severity of the issues people are, pro you know, but it, it, I look at it differently. Yeah. I certainly question some of the tactics. I've, un, un, you know, just completely bought into in the past. Mm -hmm. Dr. Haight, let me, let me turn to you, because so much of what we talk about as public discussion these days is, uh, is conducted by thumbs. It's on social media, it's text messages. Uh, has this opened up uh, a new way of expressing ourselves that has had some unfortunate uh, consequences? Yes, I think this is one of the biggest reasons to fear that our democracy might fail and democracies around the world might really fail, because there's been a big change in technology that feeds directly into some of the worst aspects of our social nature. Mm -hmm. Here's what I mean. Um, we all live in an economy of prestige. So just as in a regular financial economy, whatever's rewarded, pe people will do more of. And uh, so you know, economists study the, the financial economy. Uh, well, a social psychologist or sociologist could study the prestige economy uh, in which we do things to get us more prestige. We've, we all do this. Teenagers are especially concerned with it because it's new to them and they're, they're, not, they're very clumsy at it. Um, and what social media has done to us, uh, everybody talks about the cognitive effects, about the echo chambers, but that's much less damaging than the social effects. The basic social effect that I see working on campus and, and studying this issue um, is that communication has generally been between two people. And a, a conversation that we're having, obviously right now there's you know, people, there's live streaming, so this is not a normal conversation. Um, but imagine if all conversations were like this, where I'm not really talking to you, I'm actually talking to them. And so we often think, you know, as, as Sally did, look, you know, if I'm talking to people like, I don't wanna bash them, I, I want to convince them. Well, okay, fine, but what happens when I don't actually care about that person at all. All I'm doing is virtue signaling, trying to get more prestige. And the way you do that is by being sharper, harsher, nastier, more obscene. And so we have now immersed a generation of young people. Obviously, every age is guilty of this, but it's gonna have really formative effects on young people. What is discourse? Di political discourse is you, you, you outdo everybody else in how much you hate, how horrible the other side is. That's how you get prestige. So, um, I'm actually fairly pessimistic about the future of, of our democracy. I'm not saying I'm betting it's gonna fail, but I'm saying, you know, three or four years ago, I would have thought the odds that America will, you know, 50 years from now, will there still be a single country called the United States with the same states and the same constitution? A few years ago, I would have said, of course. And now I say, well, you know, probably, but I don't really know. And I think the reason is because the basic social infrastructure by which we interact is now very different than it was 10 years ago. And one of the most dangerous features, just to come back to your previous question mm -hmm. uh, about the shout downs in the restaurants, this is what really scares me. This is why I'm really scared. Because a civil society needs lots of different zones where different practices and norms take place. And what we do in the public square when we yell at each other has to be different from what we do in the classroom, which has to be different from what we do in the doctor's office or a courtroom or anywhere else. We need lots of different spaces with different norms by which we interact. Social media has knocked down all the walls. It's all the same everywhere. So on campus, the issue is no longer, oh, this speaker is challenging our ideas. This could be interesting. No, it's we can't give him a platform. Everything is politics all the time. And when that creeps into restaurants, this is, this is really, really dangerous. So even when it happens on your side and you support, you're glad that they shouted that person down, I would say think of the precedent setting effects. Imagine if everything is politics all the time, including your next doctor visit, including when you bring your kid to kindergarten. Imagine if everything is let's beat the other side using your child. Yeah. 
Let me, uh, <laughs> let me follow up on your despair over the future of democracy. <laughs> um, well, follow up on that. You, you, <laughs> you, uh, what, what you seem to believe is that it, it, what, what's at risk is, is our ability to form opinions, our ability to exchange opinions, get information, change our no. minds. No, that's the cognitive effects that we've been talking about for two years. We're all familiar with that. I'm talking about the social effects. Mm -hmm. So we evolved, human nature is tribal. We are primates. We're a little different than other primates, but we're similar in many ways. We evolved, and for hundreds of thousands of years, we lived in small tribes um, that circle around uh, fires and worship sacred objects, generally rocks or trees or ancestors. And this is the way it's always been until the last blink of an eye in which we develop agriculture, big societies, big gods. We, so things change very recently in human evolution. And we developed ways of living together in large societies, but it's very hard. We're naturally tribal. Mm -hmm. And if the American experiment was to say, well, let's, let's try to have a big society that isn't based on blood or soil or shared religion. So let's take the big three ways of keeping people together, say, no, we're not doing that. We're doing it based on an idea. We're doing it based on an idea about how, how if people who embrace these ideals are willing to live together and try this, that they're all Americans. Um, and a lot of things were going for us in the late 20th century. All those things were pulling for us to keep together. And one by one, the things that were pulled, you could call them the centrip centripetal forces, one by one, those have peeled off. The <coughs> centrifugal forces blowing us apart are much stronger now than they were in my lifetime. Um, and social media is one, uh, it's one of the biggest. But this is why I'm so alarmed. I think we must not take democracy for granted. The fact that it's not just us, in a way it's comforting, because you know, I'm used to going to Europe and, and we always seem very primitive to Europeans for you know, decades and decades, and now they have the same problems. The fact that almost all the countries are having these problems means there's a lot that we don't understand about democracy. We can't just assume that a secular, multi-ethnic democracy is like this stable thing that will stay together without us doing much work for it. I don't think it is. Yes, Carolyn, please, I want to draw you out about this too because uh, this organization has a stake in democracy. Well, I truly share your concerns about the assault on the basic democratic institutions and the shift in our social relations. I also want to though put in the other side of the story about what gives me hope in terms of the work we do. Mm -hmm. We work with elected officials, we work with journalists, we work with the public all over the country. And what we see wherever we go, red states, blue states, purple states, is a hunger for connection. So the basic, the fact that we're social beings despite all this assault on how we deal with each other, that fundamental desire as a human being to be connected to other human beings is deep and is very activated amongst people right now. We hear a lot about the activism that's come as resistance in the political world, and that's very important. But in terms of the level that you took it to, Jonathan, I think what we are seeing when we're in a community is everybody understands that there is a huge risk here of extraordinary dehumanization that leads to lives that none of us want to live. So I can tell you stories, and we would love to get some systematic way of getting this out into a narrative. Literally every place we go, we meet ordinary Americans just living their lives who are concerned about this exact phenomena, who are doing amazing things. Three weeks ago, I and two of our board members, Mickey Edwards and Dan Glickman, spoke in the Cleveland City Club. At the end of the presentation, a young woman, probably in her late 20s, her name's Megan Anderson, she and some of her other college mates, very concerned about this anime and the inability to have real connection, made a decision to start something called Craft Beers and Conversation. So every week, they go to a different craft beer location in Cleveland, Ohio, and they recruit people who are on opposite sides of key issues, and they spend the night talking and listening to each other. A guy named Craig Freshly in Maine, he's an organization development consultant. He said, I know something about how to bring people together. What he has started is called makeshift coffee houses. And every Friday night, they go into a different Maine community. They set up tables with issues. When you come in the door, you put your pro or your con on this issue. Every table has a really good facilitator of just human conversation. Mm. So we're seeing this all over the country. 
Most recently, one of the things that we ourselves really are excited about, for a long time, given that we're living at a time when images are so much more influential than words, the notion we've had is to create civility TV as a contrast to reality TV. And we did the filming of the first three episodes about two weekends ago in Western Massachusetts. We had 12 people, six deep Trump supporters, six deep Trump haters. They came into that context expecting to be raw, expecting hostility, expecting to actually go at it and leave hating each other. And as you've described, human beings are social beings. They respond to the structures they're in. So we created an environment where they actually first had to, by definition, meet each other as human beings not as I'm for Trump and you're for, and frankly, some of them even guessed wrong about who were the Trump supporters and who were the Trump haters. And if you look at the exit interviews where we interviewed them as pairs, they all say essentially the same thing. We came here expecting to really be in deep conflict. We're leaving. I don't agree with you about lots of issues, but I actually understand you, and I really hope that we can maintain a connection after this. And one of them has already set up a barbecue, which all 11 of the rest of them are coming to. Now, I realize 12 people in a weekend, compared to what social media can do, is a drop in the bucket. But the point is, if 12 people are doing this in craft beers every Friday night in Cleveland, and 15 more are doing it in coffee shops in Maine every Friday night, and another 35 are doing it around sustainable farming and slow foods, used to be their topics, but it's now at civility in Iowa, descendants of Henry Wallace, this is something going on in the country. But it's not known, it's not understood that these seeds but, but, are there. But it's also not clear how this translates into a change in our politics. What I mean is, if you look at the average, there's a lot to see that's hopeful. The average American citizen is very decent, is relatively, is relatively moderate, but our politics is not driven by the average, it's driven <laughs> by the extremes. Social media is not driven by the average, it's driven by the extremes. And I, I'm, I'm, for example, I'm, I'm Could just going to more? guess that people who <laughs> people who show up to a function that's based on slow foods and sustainability might have some common ideas. Yeah. But they're recruiting people who are in the opposite view of those. Oh. They're intentionally bringing them together from oppositions. And I agree, we ha something has to happen to shift systemically. Right. No that's doubt it. about that's it. The problem. But at the moment, we're not sitting with levers that can make most of those shifts systemically. Yes, fair votes working hard and ranked choice voting, which would definitely yes, make a difference. Yes. It's a really, that, that's really sort of thing important thing. Yeah. Another very important thing is changing redistricting in states. Yes. In fact, this is a, talk about one person's ability to make a difference. A young woman named Katie Fahey in Michigan was one of the people who was so scared to go home to Thanksgiving dinner that she called up her cousins and she said, this is going to, it was a large multi-generational. If we don't do something, Uncle John is going to ruin dinner, or whatever uncle's <laughs> name was. And we all know an Uncle John, right? So Katie calls her cousin, so what can we do? Je redistricting, very hot in Michigan. She said, let's put this on the Thanksgiving table. Let's talk about whether or not we could get redistricting on the ballot in Michigan. Everybody said not, the family loved it. So they started out to do it, but everybody, media, established politicians, you'll never get the 338,000 signatures you need by the deadline. They got 440 some thousand. Then both parties, the systemic problem, both parties took out lawsuits against yeah, right. this <laughs> right. to keep it off the ballot. Mm. Well, I'm yeah. proud to say for all of them, they won the lawsuits. This is on the ballot in Michigan this year. Michigan voters can decide whether to take redistricting out of the hands of politicians and put it in the hands of citizens. So it is possible. Beautiful. That's the kind of translation I'm looking for. That's great. Yeah. And the problem is most of us have stopped believing that we as individuals or we in small groups can in fact make those connections. And if we can get these stories told, and if more people share how they're doing it on a local level where it is easier to do it, then hopefully <laughs> we will make it. Yeah. But I, I, 
Let me ask you all to follow up on something that I, I think a couple of you have touched on. And, and when you talk about how we arrange ourselves tribally, I, the, the demographic information, I think, that we're beginning to understand now is that increasingly uh, people are living next door and in between people who agree with them mm -hmm. uh, on, on a, lot of, a lot of issues, social issues, political issues. Um, y y you can, as I probably don't have to explain, you can have families of different religions living next to each other who will still share, I'll make up a figure, 75% of that. Uh, and the fact that you, do you even have two families of, uh, of religious convictions living next to each other at this point, uh, you know, depending on how, um, how deeply they take it, is, is part of the problem that we are arranging ourselves almost zip code by zip code in different communities, if you please, different tribal groups. And that's inviting us to use private language and shorthand in a way that doesn't reach out to anybody else because we figure we don't have to reach out to anybody else. We're pretty happy where we are. Can, can I go a step further than that? Yeah. I don't think we're just arranging ourselves. We've also been arranged, mm -hmm. right? And this is where public policy and the legacy of this country comes into play, which is we're segregated. We are segregated. We are segregated by religion. We are segregated by class. We are definitively segregated by race. And that has an impact in our ability to understand each other, relate to each other, humanize each other. Um, there's this amazing quote from Brene Brown. She says, people are hard to hate up close. And it's not to take all of these things out of the realm of policy even more broadly than just uh, integration issues, but it's a factor without a question. We know that in the history of the gay rights movement, people's support for lesbian and gay rights specifically from the 80s through the 90s through the present increased the more that they personally knew someone who was gay. The difference is, is that we gay people, by the way, I'm gay. <laughs> Ooh, sorry. Yeah, I know. Right? You okay? No. Yeah, I'm okay. Right. <laughs> so, <clears throat> I'm my best friend. Wow. I hear you guys used to have a, anyway, it's fine. A, it's fine. A, it's history. It's fine. Flash, it's fine. It's fine. So I know. Uh, yeah. So we gay people can do this thing where we can like embed ourselves in families. <laughs> for like 18 to 35 years. <laughs> And then we and then finally are like, hey, <laughs> right? But like, you didn't call your mom and dad when you were like 21 and be like, mom and dad, I have to tell you I'm black. Like, I'm assuming they knew, mm -hmm. right? So it's different. But what's also interesting, and it goes back to this point about tribalism, and I think the ways in which we, we, we make certain assumptions about the way things always will be because the way they have been. And the fact that, for instance, we, it's true, we are hardwired evolutionarily to be uh, tribal mm -hmm. and to prefer us and to fear or even hate the them, that's true. Who we decide is the them, right? Who we hate is, that's learned. That's taught to us through our inherited history, through our policies, through our culture, through our politics, right? And, and this is where I get a little frustrated with people on my side when they're so angry at Trump voters. It's like, I'm angry at Trump voters too, mind you, but people like me have been saying for 40 plus years, hey, the Republican Party is engaged in a politics of dog whistle racism where they are you know, ex incentivizing, exploiting, and exacerbating racial fear mongering and hatred. And that is a deliberate strategy. And then when people do it, when the voters behave that way, we say, those voters are racist, right? We, we, we can't quite figure out how to talk about sort of structural, institutional, or cultural problems and not let people off the hook either, right? That it's just, it's all a little bit more complicated. Um, similarly, when we look at the history of Islamophobia in this country, before 9-11, talk to most Muslims and talk to most Muslim organizations and it wasn't really an issue. I mean, it was, there was certainly bits and pieces of discrimination, but the notion of a sort of identity of Muslim as otherized and under siege and all of that is a relatively more recent phenomenon. The fact remains in this country, majority of people don't know anyone who's Muslim, more than half. Three quarters of white people don't have any non-white friends, right? We've made progress on 
integration in our neighborhoods and schools, and yet our schools are more segregated today than they were 20 years ago. So it, it's true, it is about connection, right? And it is about what each of us can do at an individual level to overcome yeah. some of those divisions, but it is also about policy that reverses right. some of that history. I, I want to follow up on a couple of things, because I, I, I sometimes tell, well, our family, as many people here might know, is multiracial, multireligious, multi, you know, and I think it's, it's rare for them to have friends whose families are not mm -hmm. multi-ethnic, if not multiracial, and certainly multireligious. I think of that as just <clears throat> America now, and I'm, I'm, I'm very heartened by that. I mean, uh, and at the, I also tell our, our our, our daughters, whose uh, godparents happen to be a same-sex couple, um, how unimaginable this would have been to me when I attended my first gay rights march when I was a college student. I think it was 1971 or 72. Um, and how they should take that as a sign that things change. Um, because they have within my, you know, all jokes aside, relatively brief lifetime. Um, as we all have, unfortunately, relatively brief lifetimes. They think absolutely nothing of the fact that um, people they know and love happen to be same-sex couples. That's just, they love each other, they're a couple. What's the controversy about that? And by the way, I, I was, I thought that one of the achievements of President Trump's election might be to break that connection in the Republican Party. I thought to myself, Completely. he's a New Yorker, he didn't have any history that I knew about as, as somebody who um, didn't accept gays, and obviously uh, yes. I was wrong. Well, incidentally, I actually think, I thought before the election of Trump yeah. that uh, the sort of culture war was on its way out. And in a way, we could like argue that yeah. maybe it still is, and in fact, this is, uh, some would say, or some want to see this as the last gasp of the culture war. I think it's a reconfiguration and a, a reprioritization of the culture war um, in, a, in a new form, but that's true. I mean, you look at the uh, Republican presidential candidates and generally Republican Party's stance on immigration issues prior to Trump, so Romney and, uh, and McCain, and you could actually see the Republican Party, you know, yeah. winning on immigration reform and winning Latino voters going forward and a whole reconfiguration. I do think what's happening now is that there are still increasingly some social issues that are off the table, but we're seeing a reframing from sort of conventional left and right. Mm -hmm. And instead, I think the future of politics in the United States and increasingly in the world is about populism versus elitism. And I think that played out in this last election in what I think are unfortunate when, when, ways because Trump was the populist candidate, Hillary Clinton was the elitist candidate. The problem is what we're fighting over is what kind of populism. Are we gonna have exclusive, exclusionary populism or inclusive populism? Dr. Evans, let me turn to you. When you're trying to have a civil conversation with somebody about tariffs. About tariffs? Tariffs. Or, oh, I don't know, uh, what kind of flooring do we get, honey? <laughs> um, I, can, I, can, I can see a, a, a pretty easy way through that. Mm -hmm. But when the conversations get to the level of, I'm sorry, I just don't think those people should be able to marry each other, or I'm sorry, I don't know why they're always kvetching about police brutality. Don't they realize that we all need the police? I can see where people take that conversation so personally to use an overworked word these days, existentially. Sorry, I think it's you okay, just I used did. it, but right. in any event. <laughs> Um, I, I can see where people get inflamed by that and, and respond. In a, they, they feel even if the language has been civil, that's an incivil attack. Yeah. Well, and I think it goes to what Sally was saying. The, um, I think the heart, at the heart of incivility is uh, our ability to other people, right? And to not see the humanity in other people. And um, to the degree that we uh, stay separate, um, I think it, it continues that. You know, we have a lot of social science research that says that one of the ways to break down stereotypes is uh, to bring people in um, closer social contact and for people to have those experiences that fly in the face of the, the uh, stereotypes that people have. 
And I think we've created um, and we have pressures in our society that, as you say, continue to keep us more segregated, keep us more connected to people who think like us, who believe like us. Um, and don't, we don't have those experiences where we have um, uh, those, enough experiences with people who um, uh, don't think like us and, and have other worldviews. So I think that that's at the heart of, of, of how we try to, to, to break through this. Um, you know, the, the issue uh, around uh, those people and why don't those people stop kvetching or, or, or those kinds of things. Um, I also think we have to, uh, to deal with that. I also think that we have to create uh, environments where we can have these kinds of conversations. I, I think that, for example, um, one of the challenges, and talk about race, which is another very difficult um, mm -hmm. topic to, to talk about. Um, one of the reasons that we can't have a civil conversation often about race is that we don't give people the ability to make mistakes <coughs> in those conversations. Mm -hmm. So if someone says the wrong uh, thing yeah. or says it the wrong way, uh, there's a tendency to pounce on, on those uh, individuals. Um, so what that does then is it leaves only the people who are at the extremes to talk about the issue. And so it reinforces the idea that the only way that you can talk about this is in an extreme way. So I think that if we want to talk about some of these issues, whether it's race or anything else, we have to give people that space to be uh, <coughs> inarticulate, uh, to say things that are not politically correct, um, uh, and then try to understand how do we try to really understand what they're trying to say as opposed to how they, how they said it. So I, I think, and I, I'm with Carolyn, I actually think that there are a lot of things that we can do to uh, improve civility. I think there are a lot of things that, uh, and I really agree with the point that pe that's something that people want, uh, even in our own uh, association. So you're a psychologist. You would think that we would have this uh, down, right? <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, we don't. Uh, and um, God, it got I mean, to and, and what you I, what I, you guys charge per hour? I know, I know, I know. <laughs> I, know. Was that the, uh, I, I think we need to raise the rates or something. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, that's a but you point. know, um, you know, we we ourselves, our association, uh, recently created a civility work group uh, to define what civil behavior is, what incivil behavior is came up with uh, operational definition of those, uh, created um, civility ambassadors. Uh, now, I gotta tell you, I'm, I've been the CEO for only about a year, year and a half. Uh, when I first heard this, I probably, my first reaction was, we needed to do that. Uh, my second reaction was, did we really need to do that? Um, <laughs> But then I, I, I've really come to appreciate uh, people's, why people thought it was important. Uh, and I think it goes to something that, that Carolyn said. I think people yearn for civil behavior. I think people yearn to be in relationship. I don't think that most of us want to be in these antagonistic relationships mm -hmm. all the time. And I think the leadership prior to me, um, you know, were wise to understand that it's just not gonna happen because we want it to happen. Um, I think that uh, in organizations, for example, um, it takes leaders who say this is important. Uh, I think it's important for people to, to, for leaders to set the tone. But secondly, I think that it's important to put some guardrails on how we have conversations so that we don't go into those uh, areas of, of incivility. Uh, so I think there are things that we can do structurally to uh, make sure that we have uh, more civil interactions with each other. Uh, and then thirdly, and this is the part that, that uh, I've really come to appreciate, we have to be able to intervene in real time. And so one of the things that, that happens when uh, there is um, uncivil behavior uh, with say on our listserv or in a meeting, we actually have people who will check that behavior in real time. And that makes a big difference because uh, it, it interrupts that, that sort of natural cycle. Um, it, sets a, um, it sets a tone. Uh, and it's an ability for people to model. And when people have been checked, almost 100% of the time, uh, there's an apology and people uh, yeah. change their behavior. 
So I think that those kinds of things can make a big difference in how we have conversations, whether it's about LGBTQ, uh, race, um, tariffs, and the flooring. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what to put that in my. I'm, 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 I perhaps will follow when you talk about giving people the the ability to make mistakes. I'm really, mm. I'm really interested in that. We want to go to your questions too uh, in, in the audience if we can. How, how are we set up for? Oh, there's a microphone, standing right in front of me. Yes, if you have any questions, if you just want to come forward, and. Uh, Oh, good. Oh, my. <laughs> wow. Somebody has to be first. Yeah. Um, Go ahead, sir. If, if it, let us know if it's for someone specific or generally right. or whatever. Uh, well, first, you I'm want to I'm, identify yourself? Oh, I'm Dan Weiss. I am here. Um, <laughs> I have an observation and then a question. The observation about the people being attacked in the re or, you know, shouted down in the restaurants, I quote that political philosopher Hunter S. Thompson when he said, buy the ticket, take the ride. If you are going to be proposing policies like Nielsen is that throw kids in cages, essentially, then you got to be ready to, to defend it. Now, what they should have done is, let's not do this here. Come to my office at 5 o'clock on Tuesday, and we could talk. That would have been the smarter outcome. My question is, have you had or can you imagine how you'd have this conversation with, say, Trump voters? Because on the progressive side, we're all interested in this. Is the same thing true on the other side? And if, if not, how do we change it? Can I respond Anyone? to that? Yeah, I think, please. Go around, yeah. there, it's no, there's no doubt that in terms of coming to a safe space where you can have these conversations, it is more difficult to invite conservatives into that domain, partly a lot because they feel like they're going to have to defend the choices, both policy and who they voted for. But what we've found is what you do is like work we're doing in North Carolina. There's a foundation called the John Locke Society, very highly respected in the conservative community. So when we were in Raleigh and wanted to bring an even number of liberals and conservatives together to have this conversation, we co-hosted it with the John Locke Society. So you think about who are the, where in the fabric of the community do people have trust in that organization and that's how you do it. Yeah. By, by the way, I, um, I run into a lot of people on your side of the divide, Professor, who, who say they have no interest in trying to reach anybody on the other side, that mm -hmm. it's strictly a numbers game now. Yeah. And uh, they'd rather win it than lose it. Mm -hmm. uh, and that they're the, their whole interest is trying to maximize the number of people they can energize on their side. And they don't have time for conversations because history is moving too quickly. I'd also just like to add that there have been a lot of things said here tonight uh, that would be, that are critical of the right, that are offensive to the right, and there's nothing said tonight that is really critical or offensive of the left, and this is fairly typical. When people get together to talk yeah. about these things, they're generally center-left, and while they think they're being very open, they often betray their prejudices against the right. Yeah, I, I mean, I, one well, of the things I, you know, I actually, but I'll you know what? I'll criticize How much time do we have? Slight disagreement with that because I do think that that uh, it is the left who pounces when people make mistakes in these conversations. Yeah, but, yeah. So I think that that is a critique of the left, and um, it's something that we have to take on as much as we take on some of the others I, I, we talked about. I tell people not a week goes by, not a day goes by. <clears throat> I don't hear from someone on social media typically who says I don't listen to NPR to blank blank blank, and I have to wind up telling them. I'm sorry, that's what we do. Mm. There is no safe space mm. in journalism. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to hear ideas here that upset you. You know, that's part of our charm. Uh, <laughs> it's certainly part of what we do. And, 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 and yes, I, I mean, I, I think you're absolutely right. That some, some, yes. Oh, all I was gonna add is, um, you know, and this actually goes to one of the points I think John makes beautifully in, in his book, his latest book with um, Greg Lukanoff, is that there's something about giving people the benefit of the doubt, which mm -hmm. I also hear in what you're saying. And uh, I won't go into it now, by the book, but I actually, uh, but I also, I interviewed my trolls from the right. I called a bunch of them up and interviewed them, lovely conversations. Um, and the headline from that is, they think I'm the problem. 
right? They don't see themselves as hateful. Yeah. They think we're hate. Like it is, and and that's again both sides. When I say somebody's always saying somebody else did it worse and did it first, that's that's both sides feel that way, and we're constantly in this finger pointing, blame. Well, my bad behavior is excused by your worst behavior, and everyone feels that way. And that, to me, is a problem. That's actually why I spend most of my time criticizing the left, because I think, look, someone has to start first, and. Mm -hmm. Have you been publicly shamed enough, or did you <laughs> want to uh, make room? <laughs> Good evening, y'all. My name is Will. Um, I have a pushback follow-up question about the Red Hen, specifically, what happened in Charlottesville with the press secretary. My understanding is that that owner um, was called by the kitchen staff and came to the restaurant um, asked to speak with the press secretary outside, uh, said she couldn't be served, offered to comp her meals, said the family could stay, never raised her voice, and uh, then the press secretary left. What was uncivil about that specific action, and why is it being lumped in with surrounding people and yelling at them in a restaurant with a crowd of people if it's one person, a, a, you know, a conversation happening outside normal tone of voice? I mean, I think there is a difference. I think that's a fair critique, certainly from the, you know, Nielsen being shouted down in the restaurant, or I think there was a Stephen Miller, wasn't there Stephen, but, you know, in a, Stephen Miller in a Mexican restaurant. I'm sorry, that does just beg for a protest, <laughs> but, come on. Um, but here's what I also think, right? I spent, and this is where, to me, the biggest problem we have, and one of the biggest problems we have right now is a problem of hypocrisy. And there's something to be deeply uncivil about hypocrisy, which is an unwillingness to just see your own self doing stuff that you are morally outraged when the other side does. And so I spent a long time for the last five years saying that, hey, if you bake cakes, if that's what your business does, then you bake cakes for everyone who comes in your business. Just like we say, if you have a hotel, you don't say, oh, are you a single? Mother who's unwed, oh, we're not going to give you a room, right? Like we have non-discrimination laws. If you want to provide that business, that's what you do. So for the left to then, the same left saying those things, to then cheer and say, oh, but this restaurant decided it's not going to serve someone because of their politics, right. right? That to me is hypocritical. That's why I think that particular example was wrong, more so than the shouting down. Mm. Perhaps it's because our daughters are in parochial school, but I, I'm a big fan of hypocrisy. <laughs> Um, by, by that I mean... Uh, you should be very happy then. <laughs> I'm, I'm a big fan of being able to tell people, yeah, I said that once and that was wrong. Oh, okay. Uh, and I've learned more. That's different. Uh, and not to in any way compare my philosophy with Gandhi, but Gandhi was fond of when people would say, how can you say that? Mahatma Ji, you said just the opposite the other day. And he said, well, I know more today. <laughs> um, and I think part of the problem that we, that we have in having civil conversation is there's this, this gamesmanship about hypocrisy. And you can, you can Google what somebody said three years ago, and ah, it's, but it's different. Hmm. Um, I, I mean, I am, I, am, I am the one man in America who perhaps believed Bill Clinton when he said, uh, I, I smoked, but I didn't inhale. And, and I say that because he's the son of an alcoholic, and I can see where he would think, I, you know, I've heard about this growing up in Little Rock. It's devil weed. Um, I'm, gonna, I, I'm trying to fit in at, at uh, I guess, was it Yale or Georgetown at that point? Uh, not, wouldn't have been here, obviously. Um, <laughs> and he put it between his lips but didn't actually inhale. I thought, I believed him about that. Just as I, I must say, I believed Mitt Romney when he said he'd, he'd, uh, he'd changed his view on abortion because he'd reflected on it. I think abortion is one of those deeply personal issues that life will change people. Uh, but go ahead. Thank you. Uh, my name is Michael Smolyak. Uh, the question is for Jonathan Haidt. Um, we started the conversation with acknowledgement of uh, the growing incivility, and much of it happens on the side of the uh, president and his supporters. Um, I have friends who are conservative, and they've been talking all along for many years about incivility on the left and specifically uh, college campuses, leftist college campuses and uh, people being uncivil, being, people uh, being what they call politically correct and uh, not, not letting others speak. So could you put this, since you wrote a book, I haven't read your book, uh, I, I listened to a uh, wonderful interview with Sam Harris. Can you put this in perspective compared to incivility on the 
mm. side of Trump is. How big, how big is it uh, a problem on, on the left yes. and specifically in college campuses? No, gladly. So we opened up with uh, various people saying that uh, President Trump has taken us to new heights of incivility. I think that is, that is true. Trump is different from the past. But I think we have to be very careful in saying it's you know, Trump and his supporters or talking about what the people are doing. Um, as Caroline said, now we really hate the people. And one thing I can say with absolute confidence is that if you are on one side, you are deluged with video evidence of the unbelievable incivility of the other side. And you have no clue how nasty the people on your side have been. But everyone on the other side knows it. Now, I work on a college campus. I have never heard a story of a person who voted for Hillary being ashamed to admit it. And I've almost never heard a story of a person who voted for Trump being willing to admit it. If you're on a college campus, not, not all, some college campuses are conservative, but at the elite ones at the, you know, I, I teach at NYU, uh, NYU students who voted for Trump cannot admit it. You can never wear any sort of Trump paraphernalia. Um, I have not heard of cases of, so I'm just saying, part of, this, part of this is that the Democrats lost, and so they're angrier. We always have, you know, there was Obama derangement syndrome on the right, and now there's Trump derangement syndrome on the left, but um, I am not at all convinced that, the, that conservatives are more intolerant of, uh, of uh, progressives or liberals than the other way around. I don't really see evidence of that. I don't want to quantify it. But if those of you who assume that the problem is that the right is so intolerant, you, you, know, you don't have any evidence for that, most likely. You just have the anecdotes that you've been fed by social media. On a college campus, the situation is um, very alarming. Uh, I just want to add on, build it based on something that, that Arthur said. Um, what we need to do, if we're going to talk about difficult things, if we're going to have a multi-ethnic democracy that's working on making advances on LGBTQ, and all, if we're going to do that, we need to talk about it. But we can't talk about it on a college campus because we have the new idea of microaggressions. We have the new idea that it doesn't matter what you intended. That's irrelevant. All that matters is impact. And what we do when you come to campus is we teach you how to be more offended by smaller and smaller things. That's called microaggression training. <laughs> and so, so however hard things are now, when the current, when, when the current generation, Gen Z, mm. when they advance and take over the political reins, things are going to get so much worse. You have no clue what's coming. Well, look forward to that. <laughs> Please, sir. Hi, um, I'm Tim. Um, I'm from the center right, so I'm going to ask for that. Um, first, I just want to say, I still think The Righteous Mind is the greatest political science book out there, but I'm sure there's those who disagree. Um, Thank you. But I, I guess my curiosity is, isn't part of the problem is that because of our moral values interpreting things as my way or the highway, isn't part of the problem that we have to see civility in more of a universal instead of like, oh, I see myself as civil based on the right or based on the left perspective. So I guess if you wanted to add a second part, like how do you make it a, a universal concept rather than yeah. civility based on my way or the highway? Right. Great question. I mean, so I'll, I'll, I'll start on that. I mean, you know, I think we're all so good at finding justifications for whatever we believe. We think we're on the side of the angels. So if civility is going to be something that we each commit to, um, we're, 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 we're going to fail at that because we're going to think that we were civil. And in this case where I wasn't civil, boy, did they deserve it. That's, this is a different case. So I don't, look, I don't really think that we can do much as individuals. What I'm trying to do, what I'm hoping we can all do is think more systemically. Um, so let's start with any institutions. Let's start in, you know, in Congress. We, what, do we, what reforms could we do that would make things more civil? For example, I'm now a big fan of you know, the craziness of, of the way we appoint Supreme Court justices. And if we had... If we had 18-year terms and every president gets two, that would at least remove some of the craziness around it. There are structural reforms that would make things less conflictual. Um, at university campuses, I think we should, be, uh, uh, we should be setting norms about discourse and how it, really training our students really hard. You do not make ad hominem arguments mm. because what we're shifting towards is argumentation is largely ad hominem. You disc people, students are learning ways to discredit the person without ever addressing their arguments. Mm -hmm. So this is what I mean by we need to think systemically within each setting, how can we get more civil behavior? And civil doesn't mean nice. It means productive disagreement. Mm. Um, so that's the way that I would approach it. As individuals, we're going to fail. We have to think about ourselves in groups. If I can add an example yeah. um, that I think is very positive, in the House of Representatives, 
And it was really led by the freshman class that came in as a result of the 2016 election. There has been a large number of members really committing to different behavior in the context of the committees and subcommittees. And there are now actually three civility caucuses in the House of Representatives. And the one I'm going to highlight was created by Steve Stovers, a pretty conservative Republican from central Ohio, and Joyce Beatty, a very liberal Democrat, also from central Ohio in a different district. And when they created their caucus, they said you can only join if you come in as two members, one from the Republican Party and one from the Democrat Party, and if you actually have a plan of action that the two of you intend to take to demonstrate leadership of how civility does link to our ability to solve public policy problems. The particular thing that Stover and Beatty chose to do first was to actually go into the school systems, every junior high school and every high school in both of their districts, but to go in as a pair and spend time with the students, both talking about and taking responsibility for what isn't working in Washington and describing what they believe has to change about that, and then encouraging the link between the capacity to behave civilly with one another and then actually produce some policy change. So I think there are, we don't hear about those examples. And that is an issue in terms of, because we constantly hear of the other side of where the system isn't working. But there is some hope in the system as well. well one thing that I would add to yeah. that, and I, I really like that, is that uh, you know, one of the things that APA has done is to define what civil behavior is and what, operationalize uh, civil and, and uh, uncivil behavior. And, I don't think we can assume that people know what civil behavior is and uncivil behavior is. Um, I think you have a whole generation of people who watch people yell at people on television and they think that's normative. Um, and the unfortunate part about that- You mean that, on cable news services? Sorry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Some of my best friends. <laughs> um, I can't imagine. I, yeah. I lost my th train of thought. <laughs> I beg your pardon. Those but it, but it was, assholes, it was, sorry. Yeah, yeah no, that's, that's quite all right. <laughs> but no, but, but, I, but I do think we, we have to do that. We have to, to break this down. I know where I was gonna, gonna go. Yeah. You know, there's a myth that um, there are no consequences or that there are only rewards for being uncivil. And, and there's actually research that shows that uh, even when you have people who really support a particular political candidate, uh, when they, you, when they act in uncivil ways, that people actually see them in a less favorable way. What we don't know is whether that translates into them losing support. That's the next step. But there is a cost to, to this. And I think we have a whole generation of people who believe that you know, this is the way you get ahead. This is the way you get more. This is the way you, you, you make it. Um, the reality is that, that it's not. And I think we have to put that information out there as well. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hello. I have two questions on behalf of online viewers. So the first from Zach T. When should we start teaching our children how to have a meaningful, perhaps even partisan discourse specifically in regards to age and cognitive ability to comprehend or deal with dissonance? <laughs> so... One of my favorite stories um, is when my daughter was, let's see, this was during the 2016, run up to the 2016 election, so she must have been seven uh, or eight, depends. Anyway, uh, and uh, she got something in the mail. We get home, I got home, and I see my kid hugging this thing that it turns out is a mermaid snuggie. Does anyone know what a snug? Does everyone know what a snuggie is? It's like the fleece, full-body blanket situation, and this was one that has a mermaid tail and her initials monogrammed on it, and she's just like, "This is the greatest thing that's ever happened to her in her entire life." And I go into the kitchen. My partner is like, looking vexed slash angry, both because she does not approve stylistically of said mermaid snuggie <laughs> being in her home, but also. You know, I get hate mail, so she's like, well, I sent you to come to the house, like, why'd you get what the, right? Yeah. And so I said to her, I was like, oh, no, no, I know what this is. My friend Scotty Nell Hughes, who is, I'm on air with, she sent it because she knew Willow would love it. She was obviously right. 
And Sarah's like, who, my partner's like, who is, who is she? I was like, I don't know, she's, she's a Trump supporter. I'm on air with a lot. And suddenly I turn and there's my daughter, she's overheard this, and she had this Snuggie that she was clinging, she suddenly like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, she looks at it like it's toxic, and she looks at me, wow. she's like, this is from a Trump supporter? Wow. And I said, yeah, honey. I said, there are a lot of Trump supporters who are really good, kind people. And she says, oh. And then clung back to the <laughs> Snuggie and went on with her life. And I've heard her say to other kids, right, their Trump supporters are good people. What a basic thing to teach. But honest to God, like, and we don't think what we're teaching our kids, right? We're sitting around at our dinner parties bashing Trump people, and then we yeah. go and tell our kids, you should be nice to everyone, honey. Well, <laughs> right? So I also, and I do actually teach my kid, you know, like, look, we criticize behaviors, we don't criticize people, mm -hmm. right? You, you know, we don't, to your point about don't make ad hominem attacks, we haven't quite gotten to the phrase ad hominem yet. She's, <laughs> but I'm going to bring Jonathan in for that one. Um, but I think it's both being careful of what we model and then also like being very specific. We have to counter those ideas, um, and whatever those stereotypes or biases are in, in, in my little leafy Brooklyn liberal neighborhood, it's that one. Yeah, I would just add that we have a huge amount of research on how kids learn racial prejudice, and we can import a lot of that directly into here. It, it's, uh, I, I do think it's one of the, one of the great experiences of, uh, of being parents and having responsibilities for children. You become aware of the fact that behavior you take for granted in yourself or your close friends, when you see your child or children imitating that behavior, yeah. and realize, oh, maybe that's not such a good idea. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's, we, we certainly tell our daughters that they must be courteous and civil to everyone, including uh, St. Louis Cardinals fans. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that stretches it a little, but in any event, we're Cub family, but. I did read your book on the baseball book. Oh, God bless, thank you. We, I, unfortunately, that's not for sale tonight. <laughs> um, but I, I, I'm sorry, I digress. Uh, however, it is available in bookstores. <laughs> Amazon, you know. In fact, sir, if you, if you want to <laughs> use your smartphone and just order it right now, and I can read that off the card. Go ahead, I'm sorry. The second question is from Tom H. Uh, are there examples of primary or secondary curricula that include classroom sessions devoted to teaching students how to discuss emotional topics with other students who disagree with them. I'd actually uh, yes. like to respond to that yeah. at, at the Institute. We actually have created curriculum, uh, what we call text talk civility, and it's been used in high schools, been used in junior high schools, and relevant to the earlier question, in the schools that have used it in junior high and high school, they're now asking for the curriculum, <clears throat> excuse me, to be created for elementary schools. So, and I know there are many other sources of this, but there's a lot, teachers love to have a curriculum that directly addresses issues and the student's ability to talk about those issues in a way that's respectful and, and learns to understand other positions. And my colleagues and I have created a program called the Open Mind Program. If you go to openmindplatform.org, uh, it, it's five steps. It, it, it explains why viewpoint diversity and encountering others is actually good for you. It, it, it walks you through quotations from the ancients that put you, that remind you of things that you already know about moral humility and self-righteousness and hypocrisy. It teaches you a little bit of moral psychology about why we are, why we are so self-righteous and why we have confirmation bias. And then it gives you the skills to actually talk to people. In particular, start with acknowledgement. Start by acknowledging mm. something they're right about. This is straight out of Dale Carnegie. Uh, but the open mind program can be used anywhere. It can be used in a church or synagogue, in a company, any place you have a group. If everybody takes this, it takes about an hour and a half, two hours, you have a common vocabulary and a set of psychological terms. Teachers are telling us the, con the rest of the semester goes great afterwards, goes so much better. So there are, so it's one, okay, well, I'll give you one reason for hope. However dire things get, as things get worse and worse, more and more people start working on them. And mm -hmm. humans are very innovative. And so, yes, I'm, I'm, I am pessimistic in many ways, but that means more and more people are working on it. And you know, it's always been wrong to bet against America so far. And probably it's wrong to get bet against America now. And I'm not betting against America. 
but this kind of innovation yeah. is happening it's all over. It's happening it's everywhere. Let, let me interject with a question, uh, and then we'll, we'll get to <coughs> you, sir, and the, and the rest of the people that are lined up. Senator Flake of uh, Arizona um, delivered a speech from the Senate floor today uh, in which he said, look, we're going to, uh, unless there's been a change in the schedule since we've been up here, we're going to hear from two people tomorrow who have different things to say. And they are both human beings, and I would urge everybody here in this chamber, mm. listen to them. Mm. Listen to what they have to say. Don't prejudge what you think they're going to say or what you think it means. Um, they deserve, each of them, the right to be heard. Um, reserve judgment. Uh, listen to them. And on social media, I saw his remarks both praised and assailed. Of course. Assailed as hopelessly civil. <laughs> and, and people who said, doesn't he understand the other side, doesn't want civility, doesn't believe in civility. Uh, they've, they've tried to ruin uh, the woman who stepped forward already. Um, what was my question? I forget. Uh, but, <laughs> yes, sir. Hi, my name is David. I think a lot about um, conversations about race across ideological divides. Uh, and about the issue of scale. And I want to go back to that issue of scale. Y'all were just speaking to that. And I'm wondering, given that you've talked about the way that our politicians influence us on some level to be uncivil and the way that social media does that, I'm wondering what are the sort of cutting edge ideas about how we might construct mechanisms to counter that? Like, is it possible to create markets of prestige yeah. that reward civility or for that matter, are there things on the edge of your thinking around things that philanthropy might support if it's not markets mm -hmm. that they haven't yet supported so that we can replicate these kind of experiments that you're talking about? Yeah, so I've, I've had a couple of conversations with people at Facebook and other people in social media, and they're looking for ways by which um, people whose comments show any kind of nuance, for example, any ability to say, well, on the one hand this, on the other hand that, those people become more influential. So, so there, there are these companies, they're hiring a lot of social psychologists. They are looking at this. So I'm hopeful that there will be some innovations on social media that, that uh, reward, reward more, what, what you can call civil, more civil engagement and that downvote or, or downplay the people who are just throwing, throwing flames. Um, also, another thing that I've been thinking a lot recently is one of the biggest problems on social media, I think, is the fact that people who, who say something um, face all kinds of, so, so if, if, you're, if you're a woman, if you're a journalist and you're a woman and you post something, you're gonna get a lot more rape threats, sexism, misogyny. If you're black, you're gonna get a lot more directly racist stuff. There's just so much really, really nasty stuff, including threats and harassment from people who are completely anonymous and untraceable. And I've begun thinking, what good is it to have, you know, the internet, the whole idea was let's connect everybody, let anybody talk to anybody, what could go wrong, you know? <laughs> And it's now clear what goes wrong. And I think what we need is, is many fewer places where people can show up anonymously and say whatever they want. I don't think any public good comes from that. Mm -hmm. um, and have many more places where there's a little bar to entry to get in. The bar to entry could be as simple as somebody has to know your real name. Like on Facebook, at least, if you have to prove that you're a real person. You know, somebody has to know your real name. That's a little bar to entry. Another bar to entry would be you have to do the open mind program. That's something that we're exploring with Facebook. So if, 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 we can, if we can spend more time in communities that where people have at least a little bit of skin in the game, a little bit of reputation, as opposed to interacting with strangers, interacting with anonymous strangers is just bad news generally. So I think we'll come to, we might evolve, we might adapt to the point where we spend less of our time doing those, doing those things. Should Twitter permit accounts that aren't? No, I don't think Twitter should. I think Twitter should vet people so that at least they know the name. Because one thing we really have to crack down on is any kind of threat of violence. Anybody makes a threat of violence, their account should be closed down instantly, and somebody should know who they are. This is the worst thing. So you know, people can say bad things about me, but if they're going to you know, threaten my family or something, that has not happened. Yeah. I shouldn't even say that, because they, they put an idea in some crazy person's yeah, mind. Really, but, really. but the point is, yeah, we need, uh, I think, yes, Twitter needs especially to do a much better job kicking people off, shutting down accounts that are not verified. May I pursue I mean, something? I get threatened on Twitter every day. Yeah. I haven't checked in the last five minutes. But let's also be clear, part of the issue is the business model. And uh, yeah. you know, look, they have no interest in getting rid of the trolls, because the trolls are numbers, numbers are valuation. 
the, there are uh, the incentives to not solve the problem are infinitely greater than the incentives to solve it. And what the other problem is, look, th this, and this is, uh, you know, I go back and forth, I go back and forth about social media in general and my ongoing love-hate with it, and I go back and forth as to whether it is just a something that is sort of uniquely amplified existing problems in society or in fact created new ones. But the fact is, what I know is whether it's clicking or liking or retweeting a hateful negative tweet, right, that the incentives or the cost, rather, of attacking people online is incredibly low, the cost of defending right. is incredibly high, right, the, pri the, the negatives, negatives travel faster than positives, it's all true, that's true yeah. online, it's true in the media too, right? Uh, I talk a lot about how the, does everybody remember when the Chick-fil-A founder, <clears throat> there were boycotts and everything against Chick-fil-A because he, you know, supported the anti-marriage, anti-marriage equality stuff. Who, rem who knows about that? Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Who remembers when he apologized? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Mm. Right? I mean, and that's what we yeah. want, right? We want that to happen, right? But that doesn't. And that and that's not that's not just online. That's a good yeah. It's not that it just gets yeah. doesn't get posted on Facebook and Twitter, it doesn't get covered in the news media, it doesn't right? Two celebrities attack each other, we all click on that, we all retweet that, we all talk about that on the news. One celebrity or one politician says something nice about someone else, crickets. So it's also us and what we're clicking on and what we're watching. Are there any underinvested experiments offline of that about spreading some civility? Yes, PBS and NPR. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> let's not to fluff Scott's situation. Don't fluff. Finish. Yeah. I know, it's Don't fine. Go. I'm getting late, folks. Yeah. Um, Sally, please. Um, uh, yeah. But yeah. look, this is one of these things where, like, when we look at, you look at surveys, for instance, of trusted <coughs> media, right? And trusted, by the way, across the aisle. Uh, and, and it's NPR and PBS. And it has to do with public financing. It has to do with removing a corporate uh, incentives and profit-making incentives from media. It has to do with putting the public interest ahead of profit has, right? Uh, and, you know, PBS, let's at least look at, you can compare PBS more easily to cable news and people will say, oh, I love PBS, yeah, I love PBS. And then you say, who watches PBS? And they're like, well, you know, <laughs> right? And that's, again, it's, yes, it's the systems and it's us <clears throat> in reaction to the systems. And we say, if we say we don't want mud slinging in campaigns, we say it up and down. Yeah. And then we click on it, we vote for it, right? It shows. So there is something about also how we are brought up culturally, how we are educated, how we are, right? And that there has to be <coughs> some, it, it, it does make it hard to take one individual's initiative and solve the whole thing. There has to be some collective action. Uh, NPR's national audience is about 39 million, mm -hmm. which is considerably right. larger than any cable news source. Mm -hmm. They're not, I mean, not even in the same. But, but I am long over the, over the idea that, that that large audience in and of itself encourages civility. Uh, people listen. Uh, I, I, I like to think that, that uh, yeah, I do like to think that our programming evinces a civility each and every day, although we have our mistakes. But I, I, I think as its value as a public in, instruction can be overrated, particularly when other uh, more, let's put it this way, incendiary forms of expression um, attract the attention that they do, including uh, on, on our network because we have to wind up covering it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you know, in the end, we're in the news business. We're not in the public improvement business. Um, I'm sure a lot of people will heave a sigh of relief over that. But in any event, we have to cover the news. And, and sometimes people get very upset about what they consider to be uh, NPR's tone of neutrality and, and civility. Mm -hmm. Good evening, my name is Shannon Mouton Gray. Um, and in the words of Fannie Lou Hamer, I'm about sick and tired of being sick and tired. <laughs> it feels as though the weight of civility is on those who are being bullied and <clears throat> oppressed and put down and spat upon, not those doing the bullying, the spitting, and the general crapping on us. Um, that is profoundly jacked up that we are held responsible for someone else's bad behavior. 
Uh, I love Michelle Obama. That go high, they go low. That, yeah, no, that ain't working. That that because it didn't work. Clearly, we see who we have in the White House. If I sound angry, I am, because there are populations of people who've been dealing with this for hundreds of years in this country, and we are continually asked to just be patient, wait our turn, it'll be all right. Time up for over, uh-uh. I want to be civil, but let me be very clear. You come after me, I'm going back after you. There was a time for being quiet and sitting on the bus and waiting for a turn. That time is over, because black lives matter. Trans lives matter. Thank you. Well said. Does anybody want to? Well, I mean, I think that is the central question. And look, for me, and I'm like, I, you, you, I mean, I struggle with these questions, right? And I struggle with, and I hope I struggle openly and, and honestly with, personally, those tensions. Goes back to, you know, yeah, I believe you treat people with dignity and equality. That's why I believe in justice, and right? And that's why I have the politics I have. And what they're doing is so wrong that they haven't earned respect. So is it naive or even self-defeating or even pathetic to be kind in the face of such cruelty, right? And that is, to me, that's, that is an essential tension. And in fact, part of what we should be doing is wrestling with the tension as opposed to just assuming one side or the other. I do think, right, we're not there yet, and it's even hard to articulate it, but I do think what we could get to is a a politics of toothsome justice, right? Where the burden, it shouldn't, it shouldn't if, if, if you feel that the burden is all on marginalized communities, whomever it is in the moment in the discussion, to do the lifting, not just of civility, but of repairing the breach, that's the problem, right? And that's where it calls on like, so then the step in, like, let's take Black Lives Matter. The role isn't for white people to just be kind and civil, right, and like nice in the sense of ignoring, right, in the sense of not calling out injustice in the face of injustice and inequality. It's for white people to do the work, right, for white people to be the people who speak up and stand up and are shouldering some of that burden. That, to me, is then a somewhat separate conversation from how tactically you do it, right? So is it okay that white people then show up at the Mexican restaurant with Stephen Miller, right? Or is it that white people are organizing in white communities and talking about what do we do about housing discrimination and school discrimination, and right? Like the tactic, but who is actually called on to shoulder the burden? I think that is, that, that to me is a, is a manifestation of historic injustice in general. And the idea that, this is where I'm sorry, Jonathan, but the idea that the left should have to sort of, uh, I, look, I do think one side is worse than the other. I do, I'm sorry, I do. And I see it, and I see it in my own feet, and I see it in, I see it in all the statistics, I see it in all the studies that have been done about talk radio, right? That the right is more vitriolic and more nasty, that the trolling that, mm -hmm progressives get, and in particular women and people of color get, is worse. It's just worse. Now what I also happen to think is that the left is nicer to people in general and not in specific, and that the right is nicer to people in specific but not humanity in general, <laughs> right? And so, but I don't think that we have to draw any kind of false equivalence to still yeah. wrestle with the questions of who shoulders what burden and how we answer those questions. So thank you. This would be in no way comparable, but I, I, I often tell people, um, if anybody thinks anti-Semitism has been solved in this country, take a look at my Twitter feed. Mm. Uh, it no, hasn't that's, been. No, that's I a mean, mistake. Many times a day. Wait a second, wait a second. Pardon me? This, I think, is one, this is, to, to, to interpret it that way, I think is a mistake that dooms us to dooms us to never believe in that we've made progress. Oh, I wouldn't. So, no, I, I, I said resolved. I didn't, I didn't. I think did I say resolved? I, I guess I, yeah, I said, yeah. all right. Yeah. Then no, let me, then I'm being hypocritical again, but creatively such. If anyone thinks there is no anti-Semitism left in this country, 
take a look at my Twitter. Right, but that's a, if, if that should never be our standard. Zero must never be our standard. Because if zero is the standard, we will never come close. Oh, all right. And we will conclude. So I, I'm Jewish. My parents raised me to believe that America is the promised land for the Jews. It's not Israel, it's America. And it doesn't mean that America rolled out the red carpet. It doesn't mean that there was no anti-Semitism. My parents couldn't join certain country clubs, but their attitude was a big deal. They're not killing us. They're, it's an open society. We're being very successful. This is great. And things are so much better now than they were 30, 40 years ago. And so the fact that now there are actual Nazis marching in Charlottesville, a town that I love where I lived for 17 years, is horribly upsetting. And yes, I'm upset that there are Nazis marching in Charlottesville, but I would never say that the fact that social media and a few other, and this, you know, a couple people organized, you know, a couple hundred people, that doesn't mean that America is now anti-Semitic. It just means that now it's in our face. Social media has changed things. And so I see this all the time. People point to specific instances and say, well, if this racist thing happened, that means that this institution is racist. No, it doesn't. Yeah. If, it's com if that thing is common, well then sure. But if we allow anyone to say that the standard is zero, and if I can point to a thing that happened, that means that this group, this country that is racist, anti-Semitic, then it's hopeless. We will never make progress. But, now that my uh, overall uh, point has been thoroughly discredited, let me just, <laughs> let me just, let me just add a little something. Uh, interestingly, I find the anti-Semitism comes from the left or people who call themselves progressive almost as it does from the right. Well, it's very different. It's, uh, well, it, I don't think so. It, it's still, you Jews control the media or you Jews this or you, you know, and, and um, yes, I, I, maybe, I you agree. Know I do not mean to on. compare it to people <laughs> who have to live in fear for their lives, although, you know, there are a number of anti-Semitic attacks that happen every year. I don't put it on the same scale, but, uh, I agree. But, it shouldn't be yeah, zero, yeah. but the scab I, is there. I don't want to, I mean, Get in. first of all, I can disagree with Jonathan without ad hominem attacks. Love you, man. Yeah. Number one. But number two, I don't, and I want to get to the other questions too, but I do just want to put a pin in the fact that I think part of the problem is we don't know how to point out, we were talking about this backstage, but we don't know how to point out, talk about uh, systemic patterns of racism, as well as sexism, misogyny, anti-Semitism. We don't know how to talk about those patterns in ways that don't play into, well, then everyone is racist, or right? Like, that, that's not, and, and I do think, I'll be honest, this is part of the American project, right? Like, we do not accept progress as perfection, right? And we are, I think, a less anti-Semitic nation by and large than we were 100 years ago. We were, I think, by and large, a less sexist and racist nation mm -hmm. uh, but than we were 100 years ago. Or 50. Yeah. That's great. And that is in no way, shape, or form, I don't think by pointing out and holding accountable systems as well as people in systems to do better, that doesn't dismiss that progress. I think that the two have to be held together. And in fact, that is, that is fundamentally the American project. Happy Sukkot, everybody, too. <laughs> could, could, um, could, I, could I just say something yeah, yes, that exactly. I, I think is really important? Um, you know, people equate civility with not fighting back. I don't think that those right. are the same thing. Um, I think we, you can have a vigorous disagreement, a vigorous fight. Doesn't necessarily mean you have to be um, uncivil. Um, a big part of... of um, I think what we have to do here is to figure out how we can disagree uh, and do it in ways that are respectful to each other. That is different to me, for me, than being civil disobedient, for example. I think you can be disobedient civilly uh, and uh, still do that in a civil way. And then, you know, Martin Luther King is the great example of that. Uh, and I don't necessarily believe that's the only way that you have to fight back. I think there are other ways that you can fight back. But um, you know, when we started to when we started to advertise this this event, you know, people said, "Oh, you know, this is about the left tr telling everyone to be nice." <laughs> no, it's not about the left telling everyone to be nice. Um, it's about trying to figure out how we deal with really difficult situations without beating each other up, because ultimately, most of the issues that we deal with are things that we have in common. I was on a cruise boat recently. It was really interesting when you go on a cruise boat. Everybody loves everyone. And I was, I was trying to figure out why are, why, why are we so nice to each other? And I think it was because everyone realized if this boat goes down, we all go down. Uh, and, 
I think it's a great metaphor. Literally. For, yes, yeah. exactly. That's so great, yeah. he had That's a great. really good, uh, you know, a, a reason to, uh, you know, to be all together here. So, I, I, you know, I think it's a great metaphor, and I think we have to think about that as a, as a country, a nation, a society. Mm. We, uh, we have about 10 minutes left, if we could. Uh, sure, and uh, my name's Eric. Uh, good evening, and thank you all for being here. Uh, my question does build off a bit of what was just being discussed, uh, but side note, I think the free booze on the cruise ship probably also helps. Yeah, that helps. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, part of my problem uh, with how this is discussed, uh, not necessarily specifically here on this panel, but in the media, is that we are somehow getting away from this mythical civil society we once lived in. Uh, I would suggest that uh, African Americans didn't think we lived in a civil society when they were being lynched or had fire hoses and dogs turned on them. Uh, gay Americans didn't think we lived in a civil society when Matthew Shepard was getting drugged behind a truck um, and things of that nature. Um, they, those social movements uh, generally did things that were considered uncivil and made people uncomfortable. And that is certainly part of the reason why they ultimately succeeded in a lot of their goals. Um, that's still an ongoing project. And I think what they faced was certainly more concerning than Ted Cruz not finishing his dinner. Uh, so my question for you, um, as proponents of civility, uh, is a tactics question. Uh, what level of oppression and discrimination uh, mandates uh, confronting that um, with quote unquote incivility? 32%. <laughs> Just gonna go with that. I, I would say 34 points. Look, yeah. I also think this is where we are historically incredibly um, not like naively nostalgic, right? And we forget, like we look back now yeah. and we can say, oh, well, Martin Luther King, the civil disobedience of the highest order and blah, and, and the forget the ways in which he was denigrated, attacked, marginalized for being disruptive, uncivil, right? The way he was portrayed as an enemy of the state, et cetera. In hindsight, same thing with Gandhi, you brought up, right? Like in hindsight, we yeah, lionize they were people. Both jailed. And, right. Um, in hindsight, we look at the ACT UP movement and say, thank God what they did, they saved lives, they got government, to, right? And at the time, you know, like enemy number one. So that's why I think it's important to wrestle with the questions, right? And I don't, that's why I also don't um, try not to be preachy, especially around tactics. Look, I think me, I think you attack leaders, not followers. I think you attack ideas, not people. I think you uh, create, you draw moral lines in the sand while always creating the opportunity and invitation for people to change and to cross over. That's my philosophy, and I'm not saying I always live up to it. I'm not saying every action or you know, I think of everything I've ever said or done has lived up to it, but that is the principle I at least try to stand for. I think a lot, oh, go ahead. Um, so I th when people are critical of civility, they tend to point to the place where it seems least appropriate or where aggressive or intimidating or even violent tactics might seem most justifiable. And the question on the table here is not, what's the global civility number that we're gonna impose on all society and we think that incivility should be zero and everybody should always, even when they're fighting with their spouse, everything should always be civil everywhere. That's not what we're saying. Um, I, think the, uh, I, I think it's very important to think about different institutions and contexts and what we're mostly talking about, I believe, is political civility. And that means in Congress, in our political life, when we can talk about journalism, on, you know, on Fox News, on different, so if we, if we talk about different institutions uh, and then say what is the, what, how should things go? I mean, in Congress, I think we have a pretty clear case. We, you know, we, Congress, government should be a positive sum game. We think that there should be some log rolling and that people should get more than half of what they want. And if they're beating each other with canes, it probably, we're not probably at that maximal level of, of, of you know, generating goodness. Um, so I think that um, uh, when opponents of civility generally point to protests, are you telling us not to protest? The answer is no. Uh, but in most of our political life, I think most of us think that engaging with people and starting from the assumption that they're acting in good faith and forswearing certain tactics, um, if this could be a systemic norm of political life in certain contexts, we'd all be better off. The system would work better. It's almost like, imagine if in football we said, you know what, if there's so much at stake, it's okay to drug the ref. It's okay to, you know, to poison people because that'll help our side win. Like the whole game is worse off. Uh, I should have picked baseball, but I don't know anything about it actually. <laughs> I, 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 so, I think they've done that in football, as a matter of fact. 
Yeah. So the moment when this issue became really central at the National Institute for Civil Discourse was the moment of separating children from families at the border. Yeah. And the level of moral outrage across this country was extraordinary. And if you noticed, in a, it was only about a two-day news cycle when things shifted to be incivility and civility and kept us from talking about the policy of the children on the border. So I think the issue, and Jonathan already used this word, but it's all about context. If you look at America through our history, civility and respect are foundational democratic values that were actually discussed at the Constitutional Convention. At the same time, protest and knowing those moments when in fact you take seriously action, in our case, to be a country, even a revolution. So it's like it's we are equal by our society. But that reality does not mean that there are whole other situations, and we can take any one of the issues we've talked about, where by definition both leaders and we as people should be able to engage on the differences fully holding a capacity to be civil and respectful so that we can get to a compromise that will actually create a public policy that takes us forward in the aspirations of the idea of America. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I know I only have about a minute, but I'm going to try and speak as quickly as I can. I have all my points on here, and they're all over the place, and I'm sorry. Uh, my name is Patricia Rabain. I am Jewish. I am Arab. I am Irish. I am Native American. I'm a mixture of what I am, African American descendant of slaves. Now, that said and done, I think we need to have a civility to continuation, because there's too much going on here to just be left to go off into the stratosphere. But these are the points I wanted to make. Um, first of all, I think most white people were caught off guard. They didn't expect a person to be so rude and come down so hard and not care. Hmm. And I'm talking about the person at the top. Um, the other thing is, if you've ever been in a school and observed a playground, you will notice that that is a mini society of the bigger society. One of the things, and I'm going to give you a couple of suggestions, one of the things we need to do is take the most educated group, I mean, I'm not talking about the professors, we need young people, we need to take the most educated group, the college students, and connect them to every single child in the education system. One of my professors at GW told me a long time ago that the ideas that originate here takes 12 years to trickle down to the lowest level in the school system. So if we can get a jump on it and make those connections and give the students some kind of credit, some type of incentive, that's a start right there. The other thing is, somebody needs to get to all of these principles across the country. As the leadership goes, the rest of the country follows. We've seen it time and time again. We also know that this person's tactic at the top is to divide and conquer and then run away with the spoils. We have to stop that. That's what he's doing. He's running this country the same way he runs his companies. And that's one of the things we have to stop. He wants to distract and get us away from the real issues. And we know we can't let that keep going on. Get to the school systems. That's where you will make the most change if you can connect these college students to every single individual kid. Right now, our children are not reading at the level that they should be reading at, and these children need to be told you've got to read, 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 read. You can't change anything if you don't know what's going on. You can't do anything if you don't know where you came from, where you are, and you won't even know where you're going. Okay, so we need to get back to the education system and get some change going in there. Get to those school principals. Forget about the administrators. Get to the school principals. And they will affect some kind of positive change in their school. I worked at a school in 1987 for 10 years. I was a school counselor, and we were rocking and rolling. <laughs> Powell is a powerful place to be. That's where I worked. 
Okay, I was a school counselor, but then I have other interests. I transitioned into mathematics. Now I'm into applied behavior analysis because I want to understand this behavior that's going on. Okay, and I'm getting an awful strong dose of it at the other graduate school I'm at. But we've got to connect the top to the bottom. And I know the universities can do it. I think we've run out of time. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> Uh, thank you, and thanks everybody for your comments. Thanks everybody who, who's been here on the panel uh, for, I know I learned a lot, uh, and we thank you very much for joining us and hope that this isn't the last conversation that you have about civil conversations, because I think uh, we've made the case that there's, uh, there's work to be done uh, and there are common paths to follow, and uh, we can roll up our sleeves and uh, begin to do it. Thank you very much. <laughs>